Jamie was in trouble. His wife had been calling and texting for at least an hour. The first voicemail had begun with her demanding he come home. The last one had expressly told him not to fucking bother. Each text he had received sounded angrier and more insistent than the last. He used the last voicemail to reciprocate anger at her to justify his overextended visit to the local small town bar. He had gone AWOL or rogue depending on whichever gender of morality your point of view was based. Right now, he was just following orders. He had been back two months to a civilian life that had all the trappings of civility, normality, and boredom. The worst by far was the silence. Living in a rural setting, day to day was just too damn quiet. Any sudden noises or movements would trigger a reaction that was way over the top every time. These reactions had kept him alive on the battlefield and he wasn't about to switch off anytime soon. When your life depended on it, you just couldn't. He loved his wife. He could admit that much to himself, but in truth, he loved being a soldier just as much. He had to choose, and now he was having to live with that choice, which was proving harder than he had thought. The friends and family he was once again surrounded by seemed somewhat claustrophobic and were incapable of communicating with him on a level that he could relate. Just how do you tell your wife, mom and pop, about seeing women and children blown to bits and men who you trusted with their lives have arms, legs, and heads blown off? He had met too many cruel people and not always on the opposite team. His family hadn't changed one bit. He knew it. It was him that had changed. The world had shown him certain truths which most people were blind to. Once seen, it could not be unseen. He had met his wife in the army about six years ago. She had long since left and had never seen combat. A soldier had to eat and someone had to cook the food. She would have made an excellent drill sergeant. She had a tongue that could tear strips of hide off of a rhinoceros and a stare that could set a fire to a block of ice. Plenty of reason enough to be sat here around a table talking to three ex-marines rather than face her wrath. He had to admit it was this fire that had attracted him to her in the first place. Dating her had been like a male praying mantis trying to mate with a female one. You could get your head ripped off in any moment. Never a dull moment though, and once you finally got under that armor, she was soft on the inside and a woman to die for. They'd gotten married two years later and were supposed to start a family. Being a marine though had its demands and the call of battle had seduced him too. It was another four years before he succumbed to her and her demands and finally left. Having fulfilled his contract, no baby had been conceived and this just wouldn't do. The clock was ticking and his wife wanted kids now. The guys he had been drinking with had all done tours in Afghanistan, Iraq, North Africa. He felt at ease with them. He could talk plainly and openly about shit that had festered. It was like therapy. A knowing look, a simple nod was enough. Even knowing when to say nothing, they understood better out than in, as they said. Outside, it was minus 16 degrees. There was a foot of snow on the ground. Keeping roads and paths clear was a task that kept everyone busy, and there was more in the forecast to follow. It was just after 10 p.m. The bar was surprisingly busy with a blazing log fire going and its occupants were in no hurry to leave given the freezing conditions outside. Two hours later, they were all being thrown out. The bar closed at midnight and it was time for them to finally go home. They decided to stop at one of the ex-marines house for a couple more drinks. It was on the way and it would be rude to refuse. After all, a man could die of thirst out here. Instead of having just a couple and leaving though, he ended up falling asleep. He awoke three and a half hours later. The room was completely dark. Everyone had left or gone to bed. And he took out his phone holding to find the battery had died. He checked his watch and it read 3.44 a.m. He got up and stumbled around the room looking for a light switch. And after finally finding it, he put his jacket on and left. Outside it was still dark and still freezing. 
His jacket was a three-layered, waterproof, army-issued, arctic-weather, insulated parka. He was well protected against the low temperatures, and his boots were also designed for these sort of conditions. He began walking home to the north. The road, although cleared of snow, was icy as hell, so he had to be careful and take his time or risk cracking his head and sustaining a concussion on the road. Losing consciousness out here in these temps was potentially fatal. Hypothermia could set in at an unprecedented rate, and a man lying unconscious and half-pissed on the ice, well, he would succumb quickly. He walked on warily. He was beginning to sober now, and his thoughts about the reception he would receive when he got home began filling his mind. It was imperative he reach the house before dawn, if his life was going to be worth living. He laughed out loud. God's sake, he said. I've been shot at, bombed at, had dudes try to rip my guts out and slit my throat and I survived them all and yet, I'm worried about what my wife might do to me. Saying it out loud managed to give him a little courage. The birds had begun their dawn chorus which had quickened his pace. It was still dark and he figured it was around 4am without looking at the time. He had another hour at this pace until he would reach home. He figured if he could sneak in quietly, he could get onto the sofa and act like he'd been there all night. It was a slim hope, but the only plan he had. Getting into bed would only raise the alarm and seal his doom. His wife was an early riser like him, so this was going to be close. 52 minutes later, he was walking up his driveway. He had hauled some serious ass. Their home was on a plot of land roughly one and a half acres and the house was situated on the southern end of the property near the road. This made it easy to supply services to the house during the build. To the north of the property was woodland that had stretched in that direction for miles. Deer would often come onto his property from these woods to feed on the green succulent grass and the tidbits his wife would leave for them. He wanted to shoot one or two of them for their meat, but his wife forbade it. The house was on two levels, with dormer windows cut into the roof to allow more headspace into the two upstairs bedrooms. It was a typical cottage-style house, and you would expect to see in any village or country setting. His wife loved it. There were two entrances in the front and rear. All of the outside lights were on, lighting up the grounds, which was unusual. He walked around to the back, as this offered a more discreet entry to the house through the kitchen, and he would have to take his jacket and boots off. Their bedroom was directly above the kitchen, but there were far less squeaky floorboards to contend with. As he was walking around, however, he began noticing certain tracks in the snow. The tracks looked canine, and the problem was the size. Snow-made tracks seemed larger in the dirt, but even so, these tracks were huge. It looked like a pack of dogs or wolves had come through around his home. His adrenaline began to kick in as if the first alarm bells were starting to ring. Showtime, he whispered to himself. This was something he'd say to himself subconsciously before battle ensued, a mental preparation for what was to come. His senses and reflexes became sharper as he drew a sidearm. His sidearm was a Sig Sauer P-226. He held it in both hands out in front of him as he began to sweep the grounds. The gun was chambered for a high velocity, 357 SIG high penetration cartridge. He listened intently as he moved and silently as possible. He was acutely aware of this, boots crunching in the snow, but there was nothing he could do about it. He needed to remain balanced and ready to move quickly. He peeked around the corner of the building to its rear, being careful not to give away his position. The wind was blowing to him, which meant he was unlikely to be scented by anything in front of him. He checked his rear. If there was an attack, this was the likely direction it would come. Nothing. To his right, the garden shed obstructed his view beyond. He moved forward to get a better view. He could see the tracks everywhere, but... What stopped him cold was the entrance door to the kitchen lying wide open. Thoughts of whatever these things were inside his home filled his mind. His body was pressed against the stone wall of the building as he moved to the door. Before stepping through, he quickly scanned the woods to the north. Beyond the garden shed stood a cherry tree approximately 35 foot tall. 
His wife was sitting at the top of it, and he could tell she was dead. Her lifeless eyes gazed toward him as if pleading for him to help her. She had on her nightgown, which offered little protection against the cold. Her skin was tinged blue to match her eyes. Only her hands and feet were different. They were blood red. She still clutched his hunting knife in her hand. There was blood and gouge marks and snapped branches all the way up the tree to where her feet were. Somehow her assailants had climbed that far up, which didn't make much sense. She had obviously fought back to defend herself, but could not defeat the cold. He dropped the gun and walked numbly towards the tree, all caution and fear of attack gone. He stopped at the base of the tree and sank to his knees looking up at his wife. Tears filled his eyes as he cried out to her in anguish. The cry lasted a full breath, increasing no. in volume to a shout. Not her. It echoed across the landscape, over the treetops and beyond. His cry lost volume as he raised his hands to the sky, which shook. They ended up balled into fists. He needed to get her down. Grief and guilt threatened to overwhelm him. He should have been home keeping her safe, not sitting in some bar drinking with his buddies. He had failed to protect that which he held most dear. As tears streamed down his face, he realized there was no actual way to get her down other than climbing the tree with a rope and lowering her. This would not be an easy task. Thoughts of the police and emergency services entered his head, and he realized the scene would need to be preserved for forensic investigation. Why had she stayed in the tree, he wondered. Whatever had made her climb it had obviously frightened her enough that she would not come back down. He looked at the bowl of the tree and he could see some deep claw marks. This thing that had climbed the tree after her had some serious strength to do that. Blood spattered the snow around the base of the tree. There was a clear trail leading off into the woods. His wife had fought back in desperation and wounded one of these creatures, it seemed. He looked back toward the house. He could see the window to the bedroom was wide open, and there was a clear disturbance to the snow on the roof, and he could tell that she had used this route to escape. Her tracks only began from where she had to have jumped onto the ground. His focus recentered on the house. Some hope of retribution flared. Could some of these things still be in there? He hoped so. Anger settled into his mind. He channeled it to combine it with his training. His movements became quicker and sharper. He darted to where he had dropped his gun, picked it up and quickly stepped through the entrance to the kitchen. The kitchen was in an uproar. The place looked like a tornado had hit it. All of the cupboards had been opened and the contents dragged out. The fridge was lying on its side with the door open hard on the floor. Spilt milk and orange juice slew all over the place. Food wrappings were torn and shredded to gain access to their contents. He could smell urine and something that smelled like skunk and wet dog combined. It was strong. He ignored the mess and walked onto the hallway. This connected him to the lounge, main bathroom, and staircase leading up to the bedrooms. He swept the downstairs first, checking the lounge and the bathroom. There was little damage to these rooms. No food or prey was available, so they had been ignored. Paw prints were clearly visible leading upstairs to the bedrooms. The unused bedroom had been completely ignored. The door to the master bedroom was shredded. It hung crooked on one remaining hinge. There were holes to punch through the panels, all along with more deep scratch marks. There was evidence of chewing to widen out the holes. Inside the room, the big dresser his wife had used had been tipped over. It had been propped up against the door to help barricade the assailants from entering the room. The king-sized bed they both slept on had been torn to pieces. The sheets were torn and strewn about the floor. The mattress had been ripped open as if something had been digging in the middle of it, and the smell of urine was strong everywhere. The stench in the room reeked violence. As he scanned the room, his gaze fell on the pregnancy test kit on the bedside cabinet on his wife's side of the bed. He picked the applicator stick up and examined the result. It was red positive. 
His wife had been pregnant. He sank to the floor with his back against the wall. He realized now why she had wanted him to come home. She had news to tell. The type that could only be told face to face. Their plans were at last bearing fruit and she would have been overjoyed at having finally conceived. It had been short-lived, ripped away by some feral fucking dog. He should have been there. He walked back downstairs and found a telephone. He rang the emergency services and explained what had occurred. It took three attempts. The operator had a hard time comprehending that his pregnant wife was dead up a tree and their home had been invaded by a pack of wolves or dogs. As he waited on the police and ambulance services showing up, he began his own preparations. Inside the raided pantry was a removable panel. Behind it was a gun cabinet. He opened it and took out his 10-gauge Browning pump action shotgun. At the bottom of the cabinet sat his wife's sidearm, a Beretta M9. A fat lot of fucking good that did sitting in here, he said. His wife refused to carry it on the belief that they were in a very safe area, surrounded by friends and family. She resented firearms these days, blaming their allure for keeping her husband away. Had she thought differently, she may still be alive. He picked out his rifle, a British one, accurate over a thousand yards. It was loaded with 300 Winchester Magnum cartridges in a magazine that held five. With the tripod attachment, the whole thing weighed less than seven kilograms. He was intimately familiar with this gun. It had proven to be very efficient and deadly weapon, and then had dispatched a number of targets. He figured getting close would be the real issue, hence the long-range weapon. The shotgun was for up close and personal, and he hoped he would be that lucky. He took the weapons and a few other additional pieces of equipment, including two stun grenades out of his car, and then put them in the boot. He knew what was likely to happen next when the emergency crews got there. The area would be sealed off and access to his belongings would be impossible. Five minutes later, the police cruiser pulled up. Two policemen who exited were young local policemen who probably had little experience with murder scenes or animal attack victims. He went out to meet them and explained what he had witnessed. They asked him to remain in the back of their car, which had a heater on until they had surveyed the area. They came back six minutes later with grim looks on their faces. The ambulance and fire brigade had now arrived. He was informed that his wife was dead and that the incident would have to be dealt with by their superiors and probably a forensics team. They had radioed the station to inform them of their findings. It was clear neither policemen knew quite what to do other than contain the area. They took a statement from him and all three of them sat quietly in the patrol car. Only the noise of their radios broke the silence within the car. The ambulance and fire crews could only wait until further instructions before they could swing into action. An hour later, three more police cars had turned up. The sheriff in charge got out of one of them. He was an older, overweight male who had eaten way too many donuts to be chasing down criminals outside of a patrol car. He was easily recognizable around town. He wore a grim demeanor and was clearly not enjoying the freezing temperatures. He came over and spoke with Jamie, asking him to repeat his statement. His name was Sheriff Barnes. He offered him his deepest sympathies. Apparently, this was the first case involving wild animals that he had to deal with in this area. Terrible business, he had said. No shit, Sherlock, Jamie had thought to himself. The sheriff revealed that there had been multiple complaints of dogs and cats going missing in the area. There was even the case of one local farmer losing one of his cattle, and what had to have been wild dogs or a pack of wolves, judging by the wounds inflicted, and there hadn't been much left. It was the first Jamie had heard of anything regarding this, and he thought it would have been nice to have been informed that there were wild animals going around doing domestic animals harm. He remained silent, however. Better to focus on his anger and the guilty culprits rather than the inept performance of the town sheriff. During the conversation, a blacked out 4x4 Toyota Land Cruiser pulled up. Two men got out. and They were dressed in black suits and wore sunglasses. 
They had the look of smug superiority about them that could only mean one thing. Feds. They took aside the sheriff and had a five-minute conversation in private. Some IDs were flashed, and Jamie could tell by the sheriff's body language that he was being superseded. The two feds took the written statement from the sheriff and walked around to the rear of the property to view the scene for themselves. Ten minutes later, the two feds reappeared and walked over to the patrol car Jamie sat in. They asked him to go through his statement again to see if anything was different, and at the end they asked him one question. Did you see or hear anything to suggest what had made the tracks? No, was his reply. The feds seemed hostile. In fact, he was beginning to wonder if they were even that. Something felt off. Instead of elaborating on what he thought had done this, he remained silent. Later, he was advised not to leave town. He would be needed for further questions and to be informed of what the investigation's further findings were. He felt sure no one suspected foul play. They had also called in a local park ranger to identify the tracks, and Jamie felt this was a waste of time. He knew as much, if not more, than they did. One thing was for damn sure. He was the most motivated to catch his wife's killers. They may not have dealt the actual death blow, but might as well have. The sheriff had asked him if he wanted to inform her parents, or if he preferred the police department do it, and Jamie opted for the latter. He couldn't face her parents, knowing how he'd failed her. He needed some way to make up for what had happened. He needed justice. After confirming his alibi at the bar, he was allowed to leave. He got in the car and drove off into town. Once in town, he headed to the local food store and bought some supplies to last him for three days. He bought a local topographical map from a bookstore and planned out his route. He figured wolves or dogs could probably cover 40 miles in one day. It was now 2 p.m. in the afternoon, which meant they had a 12 to 14 hour head start. This was, of course, assuming that they had fled the area to get as distant as possible, which he figured would be unlikely. This meant he was looking at a 20 mile radius. Too large to cover on foot, but he could race ahead in the car and try to cut these things off if, indeed, they were headed north within the woodland. Looking at the map, there was a raised hill. The road wound round to the east of the forest. It was about 35 miles north of town. It would offer a panoramic view of the area below and perhaps give away the position of any wild animals making disturbances or calls below. The forest was too great to cover entirely from one vantage point, so he had to gamble. In the distance, he could faintly hear the whup whup rotor blade noise of a helicopter. In the back of his mind, he figured this was part of the investigation now ensuing around his home. He set off immediately. The car had chains on the tires, giving it better grip on the roads. It took him just under an hour to reach the hill, marked out on his map. The road had been quiet and only really used by local farmers, town inhabitants, and commuters. He parked his car on the side of the road and went straight to the boot. He checked his weapons and ammunition. He had a shotgun cartridge belt loaded with slugs he wore around his waist. The shotgun was fully loaded with five slugs. The rifle had four magazines, each carrying five bullets. He had a backpack containing his survival gear and food that he had just bought. Once loaded up, he stepped off the side of the road and began trekking across a field leading to the hill. The farmer's field he was crossing had been plowed and was now firmly frozen. Snow was blanketed across it and was deeper where the furrows were. He had to shorten his steps lightly to avoid dropping into them, making his progress more labored. Once across, he was on the wild grassland with woodland in front, shrouding the hill. As he passed into the woods, the going got easier. Not nearly as much snow had fallen here due to the shelter of the trees, and he could easily pick his way through as he began climbing. Sixty miles to the south, the pilot of a Sororsky UH-60 was circling around a farmstead looking for thermal signatures. His co-pilot was receiving intel over the radio from their command center. 
The crackle of static from the radio heralded the incoming transmission. Alpha Bravo, this is Eagle Control. We can confirm positive ID on Black Dog. Say again, we have positive ID. Satellite intel data indicates movement 20 miles north of your position. Over. The co-pilot immediately responded. Roger Eagle Control, moving to investigate. Jamie crested the summit and surveyed the valley floor. At the base of the hill to the west, there was grassland that extended for half a mile until it met forest. This would be the only area he could view movement from. There was no hope of spotting his quarry once in the cover of the trees. This would have to be enough. Ideally, he wanted a wide open killing ground, but experience had taught him you never got what you wanted and had to improvise. The sun was setting in a cold blue sky. Had it been cloudy, it would already be dark. Jamie settled onto the spruce burrows that he had collected. He draped a survival blanket over them and folded it back up over himself. It reflected and retained his body heat for what would be a long night. He had laminated the sheet with a camouflage top sheet to give it better concealment and break up his outline. It was completely dark now. The slab of rock he lay on was slightly down of the summit and had a small cliff face to the front. It overlooked the valley and gave a perfect vantage for sniper fire. The only problem with that meant staying still, which would be a problem in these temperatures. Any survival guide will tell you to remove oneself from the wind and cold ground if you wanted to keep warm. Once comfortable, he began zeroing in his night scope on his rifle. It had set for 800 yards, which was about 200 yards short of the tree line. While doing this, he munched on some dried beef from his pack. On the drive over to the hill, he had been musing on how to draw these wolves in. He had taken a huge gamble in coming here. There were no guarantees. He was right and could easily be wrong. Nevertheless, he was committed now and continued with his plan. He put his gloved hands together and brought them to his mouth. He drew in a large breath and then let out a long, deep howl. After finishing, he sat and listened. One thing a wolf cannot abide is another wolf that's not part of its pack. Another wolf not part of the pack in the pack's territory was a direct challenge. Any challenge would have to be answered immediately. A full minute had gone by and he heard nothing. He was beginning to think he'd messed up when, off in the distance, very faintly, he heard it. A low, deep howl echoed back over the tops of the trees to where he lay. It sounded far off. He felt a surge of exhilaration and continued listening. He waited for another two minutes and then answered back, giving a long howl. Thirty seconds later, he heard the howl again, only this time it was slightly different. It sounded deeper and more menacing. They were coming. Showtime. Back at Jamie's home, the area had been sealed off with yellow police tape. His wife's body had been removed to the morgue. A lone police cruiser sat sentry, making sure nosy neighbors did not trespass and pollute the crime scene. The policeman sat with the engine idling and sipping on hot coffee he had poured from his thermos. His heater was going and keeping him warm from the outside, which he was grateful for. Freezing his ass off wasn't what he had signed up for. A box of assorted donuts lay on the passenger seat beside him, which were already missing two of a full complement. The policeman was just taking a sip of his coffee when a Black Hawk Sororski appeared only 30 feet above his windshield. He choked on his coffee in fright and spilled some of it down the front of him. The helicopter's floodlight shone in his face, blinding him. He immediately raised his hands to shield his face, which meant spilling more coffee. It began circling the house with its searchlights now pointing around the surrounding area. Then it moved off to the north, vanishing as quickly as it appeared. The policeman sat there for a moment, stunned, wondering what the fuck just happened. A minute later, eyesight restored, he began radioing dispatch. Jamie sat motionless, eyes fixed on the area below him. The moon was out now, only with a few wisps of cloud in the sky. It was going to be a damn cold night. No snow had fallen yet, despite the forecast. 
Below him was like a stage that had been set for the ultimate suspense and drama, a showdown. The grassy field below him was lit up by the moonlight, giving him good vision with the naked eye. Only when you hit the tree line did the darkness prevail. He felt the suspense draw out. He had been here before. This was the theater he had missed. That moment, just before the first shot was fired and the enemy revealed, his senses were focused. To the slightest movement, the slightest sound, the game was now in play. It was the cat and mouse game, with him being the mouse. Only this mouse had a surprise in store. The first wolf exited the tree line and walked forward, its nose raised, scenting the air. It moved confidently, sure of its position, and the others stayed back, waiting on their leader's signal. Jamie had made some adjustments to his scope. This beast, although some distance away, was huge. The head was massive. He couldn't tell full features at this distance, but knew from his experience this creature was larger than any human. Its head was raised, with its snout pointing in the air as if it was scenting for him. Its fur was jet black. The trigger on his weapon was set to two pounds of pressure. He wanted it light, so he wasn't having to squeeze too tightly. He wanted to be surprised every time. His initial plan was to draw the pack in and take them head on. Doubt nodded him though, and now he had his eyes on his target. These were far larger and more dangerous than he had anticipated. Certainly not your average wolf. Looked like someone had been feeding them steroids. He had made some mental calculations on wind strength and direction and his elevation. He took aim and fired. The bullet caught the lead wolf square in the chest. It recoiled back as if stung by a bee arching up on its back legs. It toppled over and lay on its side. Jamie immediately chambered his next round and scanned the edge of the woods for movement. There was a stunned silence as the rifle report echoed across the theater below him. Nothing moved or stirred. He looked back through his scope at the wolf he had shot and was amazed to see it was looking back straight in his direction. Only its head was visible. It had hunkered down in the grass to obscure itself. It began moving back to the cover of the forest. He took aim and fired again. This time his target was moving and the bullet whizzed over its head. It looked back at him before disappearing from the view in the cover of trees. Its intent obvious. He fired again where he thought it might be, but was sure he hit nothing. Jamie brought his hands up and again let out a howl, mocking the wolf that he had just shot. He was worried the noise of the gunfire would frighten them off and leave the area. There was, however, an immediate response. Two wolves ran out, spaced apart by approximately 10 meters. They stayed low and covered the ground beneath their feet quickly, making a beeline for him. These things could move. Jamie brought the crosshairs on the left wolf and fired. The bullet took the animal on the right front leg, downing it immediately. He could hear it yelp in pain. Jamie switched to the second wolf. It had reached the foot of the hill and was beginning its ascent toward him. Their speed was surprising. He took aim, allowing slightly more lead time and fired. Bullseye. It was a headshot and should have killed it stone dead. He could see through the scope that the wolf's nose wrinkled in anger, and it kept coming. The bullet had split the skin on its forehead, but had bounced off the bone without penetrating. These things were built like tanks. Doubt began gnawing at him as to whether he had enough stopping power. He needed a bigger caliber round or some armor piercing. He had one bullet left in the magazine. He needed to stop this thing now, or it would be on him in seconds. He aimed for the rear of the creature and fired again. This time the bullet penetrated and brought the wolf to a stop. It snapped at its rear leg, trying to bite at whatever had struck it. He could hear it snarling away in pain and frustration. He began quickly changing the magazine. He was also thinking about what to do in order to stop these things. He'd remembered a conversation he had had one time with a tank gunner in Iraq. These boys were heroes at the time 
and Jamie had been teasing this mom while having a few beers. He'd asked him what he would do if they had a real modern tank to fight, and if the tank he was shooting at had armor that wasn't so easily to penetrate. The gunner had replied that all you could do in this situation was to aim for the weak spots that you could see, the main gun, the viewports, any machine gun apertures. They were very hard to hit, but was really your only option other than maneuvering your tank around for a better shot, or another tank flanking it. All tanks had weak spots. You just needed to know where to find them. He mused over this as he chambered the next round. He looked again through his scope at the nearest wolf he had shot. It was retreating back to the woods on three legs. He brought the scope left to where the other wolf had been shot, and there was no sign of it. He looked up, scanning the area with the naked eye. It had vanished. Where the fuck did you go, wolf? He whispered. He lay motionless and listened. The wolves would have his general location, but not exactly where he felt or hoped. The silence drew out, which made the suspense seem to build even more. The rock cluster he was on stood about 30 feet off the sloping grass below, at the front and leveled out to where it connected at the rear of the slope, extending above to the summit. It gave the sense of being on a small island in the middle of the sea. He knew it was close. Very slowly he placed the rifle down on the sheet and reached for a shotgun which lay beside him, easily within reach. Without turning his head, he focused on his peripheral vision. It had to be to the left of him. He would have seen it if it had crossed to the right. Unless it did so just below where he lay now. Slowly, he turned to the left. Nothing. He tried to put himself into the mind of the wolf. What would you do? He thought to himself. There was no way to know. This wasn't a human being. It didn't reason the way humans would... So trying to second-guess its behavior was pointless. All he had was his instincts. Jamie took a deep breath and let it out slowly. He relaxed. He had been baptized in war. He had been triumphant in his victories. He was the only one with the big brain, the training, the alpha. This wolf wanted to dance, and he was going to show it how. Showtime. He rolled out of the sheet to his right, onto the rock, coming instantly to a crouch, the shotgun already in his hands. He swung round, sweeping, the area immediately to his right and then behind. The wolf was there, directly behind him. It had jumped up on the rock and was now only twenty yards away. It growled at him, showing its teeth. The growl was like nothing he had ever heard before. It seemed so deep as to vibrate his organs, making him feel like he was small and weak. He waited, staring at it. It was huge. Its back legs seemed overpowered. Its front legs seemed longer and more ape-like. Its front paws were elongated with claws extending from already extended toes. Its right foreleg had blood matted in its fur. At the shoulder, where he had shot it, its chest was wide way wider than any dog or wolf should be. It had to be some kind of mutant, a genetic abnormality. Its head was just savage. If those jaws clamped around any part of Jamie's body, he wouldn't be getting it back in one piece. He was crystal clear on that. The wolf seemed to savor the standoff. It snapped its jaws at him, emphasizing the power and threat they posed. Then it did something unbelievable. It stood. As it stood, it held its right foreleg in close to its side, protecting its injury. It walked forward a few steps, then raised its head and let out a howl. It towered over him. Jamie stood six foot three inches tall. This thing had to be three feet taller. Jamie stood to meet this threat. Oh, you can stand, can't you? He said to it. He was looking this thing dead in its eyes. Can you still lick your fucking balls, though? The last sentence was more of a shout and a clear challenge to the wolf. Its temper flared and it sprang forward to attack. Jamie was already raising the gun before he'd finished talking. 
Satori kicked in, and at time, it seemed too slow. The wolf's advance, which was lightning fast, instead came in slow motion. As it moved to within striking distance, the moment came into focus, extinguishing any fear or inaction. He accepted his fate. There would be no flight, only fight. The wolf had leapt forward toward him, its jaws opening to close around his throat. Jamie was already lunging forward to meet it, then threw his feet forward and lay back. As he fell to the ground, the jaws of the wolf snapped in midair, where his face had been milliseconds before. Its body was flying over him in the opposite direction as his momentum carried his body underneath, sliding on the snow-packed rock. Simultaneously, he brought the shotgun up to the underbelly of the beast and fired. Jamie had loaded the gun with one-ounce steel slugs. They were an extravagance from a standard lead ones, but his instincts had made him opt for these. He had a limited amount, and there were only five loaded into the gun. The rest were just standard lead slugs. The slug penetrated its abdomen and smashed into the spinal column. It ricocheted off, angling into the rib cage and tearing through its lungs. The beast let out a gurgled howl and fell to the ground, its momentum carrying it forward and then carried it, sliding off the rock, down to the slope below. Jamie came to a stop and stood. He reloaded the gun without even realizing what he was doing. He walked to the edge of the stone slab and looked down. The wolf lay at the bottom of the rock face, panting its last breath as it lay dying. Jamie surveyed the slope beyond and could clearly see seven more wolves advancing on him. They were 300 yards out, standing only a few meters apart. He was clearly visible to them as they were to him. They began to run. Jamie understood now why his wife had remained in the tree. There was no defeating these creatures, such as these en masse. They were terrifying creatures. The kind they told about you as fairy tales and gave you nightmares as a kid. He decided he was going to take as many with him as he could. The beasts were running at full speed now and covering the ground fast. The one in the middle, which was the largest one, was the one he had tried to shoot first, the leader of the pack. They were now within 150 yards. He could make out its features now. Its face had two long slash marks across the top of its muzzle. It had what looked like a wet patch of first center of its chest where he had shot it before. Jamie's anger boiled up, recognizing this one as being the one his wife had defended herself against. He had found his wife's killer. He drew two grenades from his belt and pulled the pins. He threw them out towards the slope below the advancing wolves and then crouched down with his back towards them. He covered his ears and shut his eyes. The stun grenades exploded, sending off blinding light and the sound that sent shock waves echoing across the hill slope. Jamie stood and turned to survey the area. The wolves were snapping and snarling, shaking their heads as they stumbled around, trying to regain their balance. Jamie crouched and swapped guns, picking up his rifle, and made adjustments to the scope for the shorter distance. He calmly lifted the gun and took aim. The lead wolf had its head turned the wrong way. There was no clear shot. He moved the scope to the right. The wolf closest was standing, looking in his direction, confused. He zeroed in and fired. The bullet caught the animal of its left eye. Its eye exploded on impact, dropping it to the ground and killing it instantly. Son of a bitch, Jamie thought. That fucking gunner had been right. He brought the gun back to the lead wolf. It was looking directly at him. It seemed to have a miraculous intelligence about it. It emanated hate, and the look it was giving him made its intentions clear. Their recovery time had been short. He fired again, aiming for its eyes. It anticipated this though, and crouched down, lowering its head. The bullet fired harmlessly over, missing its target. Clearly intelligent. Again, they broke into a run. They were too close now for the rifle to be effective. He swapped guns, opting for the shotgun. They stormed up the sides of the rock he was on, flanking him. There was no escape now. He backed up to the edge of the rock slab. The wolves stormed upwards and were now at the other end, where the wolf he had first killed had surprised him. 
They stopped and waited for the Alpha to advance. This would be his kill. The Alpha stood up on its hind legs and took a few steps forward, positioning itself in front of the others. They kept their heads low, growling at the meal to come. The sound from the growling seemed to affect Jamie's vision. His eyes were blurring. He dropped down to one knee, bringing his center mass into a smaller target. It seemed to help, and he refocused on the Alpha Wolf. He brought the shotgun up and aimed at its head. It stopped advancing, recognizing the weapon. Its top lip curled as it let out a snarl. It stood even taller than the last one had. It must have stood at least ten feet tall. Jamie knew he wasn't going to be as lucky as the last time. There was no way he could shoot these creatures down before they ripped him apart. Just as he was about to pull the trigger, the wolf stopped and looked behind them. Their ears caught and twitching, they could hear something. They shifted uneasily as they focused on this unseen threat. Jamie wasted no time and fired at the back of the Alpha. The slug slammed into the back of its head. It roared in pain and rage as it turned to face him again. The slug hadn't penetrated. The other wolves turned back, and he was their focus once more. Then he heard it. As the sound entered his ears, recognition of what it was dawned, and he looked up toward the summit. The Sororsky Black Hawk helicopter thundered overhead. On its sides were mounted M2 variant heavy machine guns, manned by gunners. It had grenade launchers mounted lower, down, executed by the pilot. As it flew over, it banked to the right, already having dropped its concussion grenades to the target area. The maneuver opened up the range to its starboard gunner. He wasted no time opening up, firing 50 caliber armor-piercing bullets. As the grenades detonated, the blast wave flattened everything in its radius. Jamie had stood there with his mouth agape. The helicopter thundering over his head was the last thing he'd expected. He watched it as it banked to the right and saw its machine gun begin firing. When the grenades began detonating and the blast wave picked him up off of his feet and threw him back, he was thrown off the edge of the rock to the slope below. Stunned and ears ringing, he fell and landed awkwardly on his left leg. As his body slammed to the ground, he was badly winded. The slope dissipated some of the fall as his momentum carried him down the slope. His body felt numb, and he could feel this intense heat welling up inside his body. The feel of the cold snow on his face felt good as he began to lose consciousness. Just as he was blacking out, he saw the gunner firing and tracer fire shooting out. They brought the rain, he whispered, smiling as darkness took him down to its depths. When Jamie awoke, he was lying on a hospital bed. He had been unconscious for three days. His left leg was raised up and in plaster. His body and head was swathed in bandages, along with his left arm. His face had some sort of dressing over it on its left side. He ached all over. Both sets of parents were in the room. He looked over to his wife's mother and father and wept. They were all crying now as her parents stood over him, holding his good arm. I, w I wasn't there to protect her, he told them. I should have been there, he kept saying. I'm so sorry. A few days later, he was sitting up in the hospital bed looking, more alert. He had received a fractured skull, a broken ankle, and all kinds of scrapes and bruising down the left side of his body. But he was alive. A nurse walked in and asked him if he was feeling okay to receive some visitors. He agreed, thinking it was more family or friends. Instead, it was the same two feds he had spoken to at the house. They began asking him questions about his ordeal. He played dumb, saying he had been out for a walk and had fallen over. Well, that was some fall. They had said, Fuck you, he said back. Before leaving, they told him they would be watching him for a while, and he was to be careful about what he spoke about to the press. The threat was as clear as the certainty they knew what he'd been dealing with. Two weeks later, he was at his parents' home. He could get around okay on crutches, and the meds kept the pain manageable. There was a lot of work to do on his own home that other people were dealing with. He wasn't sure if he could go back there, not after the funeral and everything that had happened. He sat in a booth in the village coffee shop reading the coroner's report. 
It had informed him that his wife had succumbed to shock and hypothermia, which is what had killed her. She had sustained minor injuries to her hands and feet. And there was no mention of wolf attack in the report. As he sat there, sipping on coffee, a man entered the shop and sat down in front of him. He carried a large envelope under his arm, which he now placed on the table in front of Jamie. He looked in his forties and had a hard look about him. He was clearly military. He began reciting Jamie's full name and military service from start to finish, congratulating Jamie on an exemplary service record. You've seen plenty of combat, soldier, he said. In fact, you've seen some combat recently you didn't sign up for. He pulled out photographs from the envelope and placed them in front of him. Jamie picked them up and began looking through them, one at a time. They showed the aftermath of the battle. The wolves had been cut down, butchered by the assault the helicopter had wreaked upon them. He was surprised to see the photos of what looked like a small burnt-out cave or dugout. The last photo showed Jamie on a stretcher, unconscious, inside the helicopter's loading bay. He checked the photographs carefully again, looking for the Alpha's remains. Jamie looked up at the man. Who are you, and what do you want from me? He asked. The stranger looked at him for a moment, and then replied. Soldier, I represent a privately funded rapid response group. We deal in solving pest control problems of an unusual nature, you might say. I'm here to offer you a job. Jamie gave him a hard look and asked, And what kind of job would that be? The stranger looked at him for a moment while he pondered his answer. There are those who run and hide, soldier. They hide under their beds and hope the bad things go away. And then there are those who face the monsters that are at their door. Folks like that are rare. What you took on out there should have eaten you and shit you out. And yet, here you sit. I'm offering you a chance to face those monsters and help keep them at bay. This world will not admit to the terrors in the night that chase frightened women and children up trees to freeze to death. Ain't that the goddamn truth? Jamie said coldly. He looked at the stranger and nodded for him to continue. The stranger asked him how he knew about the location of their den. Lucky, I guess. He replied, having no clue about that detail did explain the wolf's challenge instead of retreat though what do you call this unit of yours jamie asked alpha bravo the stranger responded and you are jamie asked again i'm known in the unit as uncle sam he responded just sam is fine though well sam if i was to join this unit of yours i'd need certain assurances which are sam asked one of the wolves is missing from these photographs. I don't know how it got away, but it did. That wolf and I have some unfinished business. I will find that son of a bitch. And when I do, I'm going to kill it, with or without your help. Deal, Sam replied. Mm -hmm.